Hi everyone, welcome back. This is part two of our chapter one. In the first part of the video, we gave an introduction to the nutrients. We talked about carbs, fat, protein, water, vitamins and minerals, and then we gave um, a, disc, uh, a little bit of brief structure. And then of course, we talked about the function of each. Okay, next, we're gonna go through a couple of odds and ends here in this intro chapter. One of which is, well, how do we know what we're supposed to eat, right? What are the nutrient guidelines out there? Um, are they any good, how to follow them? So here's a brief introduction. There are several different types of guidelines. You are not gonna to need to know all of them. I will introduce some of them just so you're aware of them. And then I'll let you know which guidelines we're gonna use. And you know why this is important. Um, even though I've already, hopefully, I've already made the point that no one's perfect um, and it's kind of not fun to be perfect especially if you try and be too perfect, then a lot of times um, you end up kind of, at least I can only speak from experience, end up binging later anyway. So it is all about moderation. But without some kind of roadmap, without some kind of guidelines, we wouldn't have any idea. So I know you're probably rolling your eyes, like do we have to talk about nutrition guidelines? The answer is yes, just like an athlete has a training plan. If you don't set up a plan, then you might just go out every day and do whatever you feel like, but there is no rhyme or reason to it. So we have to talk a little bit about it. These are the things that I'd like you to know. So there's a set of guidelines called the Dietary Reference Intakes, DRIs, and they consist of a lot of different specific guidelines we're gonna talk about the RDAs, which is what's on the back of a nutrition label on your food. We're gonna mention the tolerable upper intake level. Say that 10 times fast. And then we've already begun talking about the acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges. But the good thing is you don't need to know the exact words, just know AMDR. You can read about how these guidelines were developed but the point is they are developed based on research. We like that. You don't need to know the EARs. I've given you information in case you're interested. Here's more information about the EARs. But we like the recommended dietary allowances, the RDAs. And you can read about the background. I'm not gonna ask you specifics about the background, but if you wish to read it, you may. These, the RDAs have recommendations that are set a little bit higher. And all that means is we're sure to meet the needs of most people. I'm not gonna ask you this difference here, but it's just there, FYI. The point is these RDAs, because they're set a little bit higher, isn't it better to kind of err on the side of being a little higher? Of course it is. The reason this is important is because it allows these recommendations to meet the needs of pretty much everybody. So 97 to 98% of the population, these guidelines will fit for. It can't be 100 because um, people have specific needs. So it's really impossible to set one guideline that fit everybody. But um, this fits almost everybody, and that's pretty darn good. Here's some more background information comparing the EAR to RDA, but you do not need to know them. Here's another example, but you don't need to know these, the adequate intakes. Um, any textbook for nutrition will give these to you. Um, it's a good reference, but I'm not gonna ask you. I mean, this shows everything. It shows our adequate intake for different things. It shows the RDA, which we like. It shows a bunch of things. I would like you to know the tolerable upper intake level. And this is just how much we can ingest of something without harm. 
In particular, this is beneficial for vitamins and minerals. So particularly with vitamins and minerals, it's possible if you take too many of them that um, you could have toxicity. So these are pretty helpful. Here are some examples, and it gives you the amount that could become toxic based on the different vitamin or mineral and for different age groups. I'm not gonna ask you these specific ones, but uh, it's a nice reference. All right, cool. Now, another way to look at it, as we've already introduced, is something called the AMDR. And this is a more general way. So instead of giving specific grams, you know, the RDA for carbohydrate for an adult male is 350 grams of carbohydrates per day. The AMDRs is a percentage. What percentage of your diet should come from carbs? What percentage of your diet should come from fat? And I really like these because they are nice and simple. They also give a range which means that there is room for movement. For example, if we look at the carbohydrates, it gives us a range. So maybe for someone who is not an athlete, they probably fall on the lower end of the carbohydrate need, maybe 45 to 50% or a diabetic. Versus on the other extreme, we have a marathon runner. They're going to need a lot more carbohydrates. So they may be at 60, 65% of their diet from carbs. These percentages you need to know, my friends. We already talked about them when we introduced the nutrients. Um, this should be an up arrow. Sorry. This is the example I just gave. Look at me. So the beauty of the AMDRs is we can adapt them based off of uh, a person. More examples, a diabetic um, will require less sugar and a lower fat diet versus a weightlifter who's gonna need more protein. So you can adjust these percentages as needed. And there's not one specific right answer for everyone, um, but it allows us some variability based on individuals. Cool. Everyone remembers, you know, or maybe not, because you're not as old as I am, probably the food guide pyramid, but before that was the four food groups, remember that? When I was a kid, the four food groups were the thing. Then we had the food pyramid, and then we have an updated food pyramid that is three-dimensional. Look at that, because it includes physical activity. There is even an athlete food guide pyramid, and now the government has its own website, isn't it fancy, called My Plate. Just know these are available. I am not going to ask you these specifics. I think that would be ridiculous. Um, know that the pyramid exists, but I'm not going to ask you the specifics. The athlete food pyramid is kind of a variation on this. Here it is. I'm not going to ask you the specifics, but it's nice to know that it exists. My plate is on the government website. You can go on there yourself, put in your age, um, estimated activity level. I think it might ask for your height and weight, can't remember. Um, and it will give you uh, a basic idea of what each plate should look like. The basics of my plate, and I'm just gonna ask you to know this because I like it. The basics of my plate show that Half, you know you have your dinner plate, right? Half of it should be fruits and vegetables. Now ask yourself, how many of you, every plate of food that you have in a meal, half of that plate is fruit and veggies? Probably not a lot of you. Usually the meat and the potatoes takes over more of it. But I just like this idea that when you look at it, Half should be fruits and vegetables. Now, of course, not every plate would do that. Maybe one plate you have more fruits and veggies, and then later you have a little bit less. But the overall balance, this is a good goal to have. 
Um, I think we're up to, let's see, this year, I believe. I'm not going to ask you about these. The government can also, the government also releases the dietary guidelines for Americans. The problem with this one is that even though they review scientific literature, they're also influenced by lobbying groups. If you don't know about them already, folks, the sugar lobby, the meat lobby, they pay lobbyists hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to go to Congress to tell them what to do. And these are also organizations, the meat group and the sugar group. These are also organizations that give political campaign money. So if you're a congressperson and you're getting a million dollars from the National Sugar Institute of America, who owns all the soft drink companies, it's going to be hard to say no to them when they're giving you a million (coughs) dollars. Excuse me. So, of course, that's problematic. I'm not going to ask you about this, but just telling you. For the 2016 edition, these are some of the examples. I'm not going to ask you them, but they're here if you are interested. Okay. Our next little blurb is we have to introduce ourselves or familiarize ourselves with the food label. The beauty my friends, is that it is standardized. So here in the great U.S. of A, every nutrition label looks the same. And that means it should be easier for us to read. You know, back in the old days, there really wasn't a food label. But did you know, as early as 1920, the FDA was around and they said, you know what? We think that we should require food companies to put what's on their food in the label. That's a pretty important thing. You know, before that, uh, a food manufacturer could put whatever they want in there. Um, And now they were required to at least fess up to what's in it. It was a good step. The most recent version, 1993, which perhaps a lot of you weren't even born yet. Oh, dear. Um, Actually, I think there's been a more recent one since then. Okay, either way is fine. I'd like you to read through this. Here is, here describes what types of things in the grocery store require a food label and what types of things in the grocery store are exempt. Because sometimes you can't put a food label. For example, how are you gonna put a food label on an apple? So there are some exemptions. An easier way to think about it, okay, and I'm trying to help you here. What is required to have a food label? Let's see. Um, Okay. Required to have food label. As I'm looking at this, it's a little confusing and I apologize. So that's why I'm trying to simplify it. So let's talk about what things in the grocery store are required to have a food label. The answer is all packaged foods. And these are going to be the things that you find in the aisles. So really, any packaged food, and these are going to be primarily in the grocery store aisles. They must have a food label. The box of cookies, the cereal box, the can of beans, the box of spaghetti, all these things that are packaged. And what we find as we go up and down each aisle, even like the frozen food section, that's in an aisle usually. Uh, The frozen food section, well, you get a bag of frozen broccoli. It's got to have a food label on it. What is exempt? In other words, what doesn't have to have a food label? We think about produce. Now, as you see down here, produce and meat. Now, sometimes the packaged meat will have a food label on it right? The packaged meat will have a food label. 
Sometimes the meat that you get, you can go to the counter and say, "Oh, I want to get a pound of this." That doesn't have a food label, and this is an extra thing right here. But these, the produce and meat, you're they're supposed to they're supposed to supply the nutrition information if you ask for it. So it's available upon request. Um, other things that might be exempt from having a food label on it there in the grocery store would be items like the deli, the bakery. Now again, sometimes if they prepackage some things, if they prepackage a pound of ham in the deli things with you know what they do now, it might have a nutrition label on it, but it might not. You know, if you go and you go to the bakery and you want to get a dozen donuts and you get to choose which ones you want, there's not a nutrition label on there. Okay, and then also what would be exempt could be bulk. So whatever bulk items you can get in your own amount, maybe it's coffee, you know, they have fresh ground coffee, you can pour out however much you want. Sometimes there is like bulk spices, bulk granola. Okay, so you should know those. I'm trying to simplify it. What is required to have a food label? is all the packaged foods in the aisles. What is exempt would be usually things along the perimeter. So notice if we talk about things that are required in the aisles, well, along the perimeter, oh, my cat has come to say hi. Hi, little Kima. Things that are around the perimeter, the bakery, the deli, and the, the meat section, and the produce, things around the perimeter are usually exempt either because it's not possible to put a nutrition label on an apple or it's a bulk item. Okay, good. If you have questions, reach out to me. All right, now let's actually break down a nutrition label. As I said, they are standardized. So you can see on the left here, all the things that each nutrition label must have. They will have the serving size, the calories per serving, the grams of carbs, fat, protein, cholesterol, sodium, etc. They will also have an ingredient list below. And what I want to point out, they will offer percentages of daily value. And what that is, is it's the percentage of that nutrient based off of a 2,000 calorie a day diet. So in this example of macaroni and cheese, one serving is one cup. And then have a look, how many servings are in this box? Two. Let's be honest, most of us will eat the whole box, come on. So if you eat the whole box, because each serving size is a cup, and this contains two cups, you'd have to double this. So if I ate the whole box, that would be 24 grams of fat, which would be 36% of all the fat that I need that day. If I was on a 2000 calorie diet. So remember, this is a good kind of middle of the range, but there's gonna be people that need less calories than that. And there's gonna be people that need more calories than that. So I want you to know this. When they give these percentages, it is based off of a quote-unquote standard 2,000-calorie diet. Okay. Every nutrition label is also required to have an ingredient list. What I would like to point out is whatever is listed first is present in highest amounts. So it goes from highest amounts to lower amounts. Whatever is listed at the bottom is present in lower amounts. Okay, so, you know, a lot of times for these packaged foods, particularly LA Light Bars, legendary taste. What's the first ingredient? Sugar. <laughs> they call it caramel, which is really burned sugar. And you can see all the things that are put in that. Corn syrup, sugar, cream. Yeah. Yeah. So the things that are first are in higher amounts. I've just given you some examples. You do not have to know these, but I give these examples so you can practice looking at the nutrition labels. Here's an example of non-fat milk to 2% fat milk. And you can compare the amount of fat, 
Um, you can look at the nutri the vitamins and minerals, which in this case are the same, which is good. I'll give you an example of a cliff bar. All right. Um, if you look at what it has most of, well, it's got some fat. It does have a good amount of protein. But what does it have the most of? Sugar. And it has more sugar than you probably need. But why do they add the sugar? I can hear you saying it. Because it tastes good. Makes you want to buy more. All right. When it comes to supplements, this is kind of a sticky wicket. What I talked about the nutrition label that we just said, that was for food and drink. Under the FDA, the supplements fall into a separate category. So basically, supplement companies have to show a label. Supplement companies have to have a label, but what they put on that label is not regulated. When it comes to your box of cereal, it is regulated. You can't lie because they do tests. But that is not true of supplements. So are supplements regulated by the FDA? In some ways, yes, but really, no. You should know this. Supplement companies are required to have a nutrition label, but they can say whatever they want. What they actually say on it is not regulated. And you know, Independent companies have done research studies where they, for example, in this whey protein, you have, um, they'll take a sample of whey protein from that and then they'll analyze it. And they'll see, does the sample of whey protein from that container actually contain what they said it does? Largely, the answer is no. So you have to be careful knowing that because what is the overall goal of these companies? Well, of course, it is to make money. All right. Now, another thing associated with nutrition labels would be nutrition claims. And you may not have known this, but these claims, whatever companies put on them, low fat, reduced sodium, heart healthy, they are regulated. So they are regulated. You do not have to know these specific things. It will not be on any quizzes or exams. However, I would like you to know that many claims are regulated. So you don't have to know the specifics, but I would like you to know that in many cases, not in all, but in many cases, these packaged food companies are required to meet a certain criteria. For example, for a packaged food item to say it is low calorie, it must have 40 calories or less per serving than the regular version. If something says calorie free, that food item must have five or less, excuse me, must have less than five calories. So it's not really free, but less than five calories is pretty free. So it's interesting to see this. They actually do have to meet some guidelines. Here we go. I gave an example of Doritos, the regular version, eight grams of fat per serving, to the reduced fat version. So the regular has eight grams per serving, the reduced fat has five grams per serving. Does that meet the guidelines? Well, what do the guidelines say? What is it? Reduced fat. What do the guidelines say? For reduced fat, that must have 25% less fat than the regular one. So the reduced fat has 37.5% less fat than the original. So this does meet the requirement. There's other ones in order for something to say lean or extra lean or high in. There's other things. And this is interesting. I'm not going to ask you this on an exam, but it's interesting. You know, you go and you buy some packaged ground beef or packaged chicken breast. If it says, quote unquote, lean, it can have 
anything less than 10 grams of fat per serving. So when you look at these, a lot of times that lean meat, they'll put you guessed it, 9.9 .9 grams of fat. They'll fill it with as much fat as possible. So you may think lean, oh my God, it's really lean, but it could have 9.9 .9 grams of fat per serving, which might be okay, but it's good to know. So here is, look at this, from Hannaford, 90% lean, but they chalk it full of as much as they can, 9.97 .9 grams. And another thing I want to point out, most of us have more than one serving. Um, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, one serving size of meat is three ounces, which is the size of the palm of your hand in most cases. So a lot of us have more than that. Here are some other examples. You do not need to know these, but if a cereal or a gallon of milk says it's enriched or fortified or processed or refined. They have to meet certain guidelines. You don't need to know these, but they are there. I've given you some examples. Um, you are not going to need to know these, but they're here if you want to practice. Some examples of fortified foods, and just as an FYI, when they say fortified, because what happens is when they have these big processing plants in the, in the process of processing, a lot of, ingre uh, a lot of nutrients are stripped out. And when they say it's fortified, they replace whatever nutrients were lost during process above original levels. So that's usually a good thing. So here we can see fortified milk fortified with vitamins A and D. And that's a really common one. So most milks, be it um, cow milk or soy or almond milk, they add vitamin D, they fortify it, add it above whatever was there, which was not very little. And the reason why is because in this country, sometimes, especially with our lifestyles of working in a cubicle, it's difficult to get vitamin D, so they fortify it. Here are some other examples of orange juice fortifying with omega-3 fatty acids. All right. This will not be on your test except for this last one. So I would like you to know this, but you don't need to know these. There are even more regulations in types in terms of what kind of claim a food company can make. So a food company can make what's called a nutrient content claim. It can make a health claim or it can make a structure function claim. Here is some examples of nutrient content. You do not need to know this, but it's here. This is what we already talked about. In order for a packaged food to say high fiber, low fat, low in cholesterol, reduced fat. In order for a company to say that, they have to meet the criteria. That's good. It's regulated. They cannot lie to you. A health claim. In order for a packaged food company to make a health claim, they also have to provide scientific research. For this Cheerios box to say, can help lower cholesterol. In order for them to be able to put that on the box, they had to supply some scientific data to show that it was true. That's good. Some regulation about what we're putting in our bodies. However, these structure function claims, which is what we see a lot of times on supplements, these structure function claims are not FDA approved. So you can say, um, help support a healthy immune system. That's a structure function claim. You can say, increases fat metabolism. That's a structure function claim. And they can say that without supplying any data. So really my friends, these supplements will make a structure or function claim on their label and say whatever they want to. You should know that, right? I think it's important as a consumer. 
We're going to talk a lot more about supplements later in the semester. Okay, uh, another little odd and end here in this beginning chapter is serving sizes. As I mentioned on the meat package, one serving size of meat on those packages is three ounces. And the reason that we care is because when we're trying to keep track of what we're eating, well, a lot of times, folks, you're ingesting more than what the food companies consider one serving size. Sometimes that's okay, but it's important because if you don't consider serving size, you're not really adding up what you're bringing in properly. Okay, here's an example of some serving sizes. You only have to know what is in red because I am nice, despite what they say about me online. One serving size of meat, chicken, or fish is three ounces. And this is just to help you understand what three ounces is. The palm of your hand, a smaller female hand usually, or a deck of cards. One serving size of cooked pasta is one cup. And that's kind of like what amounts to a baseball. That might surprise you and it should because these serving sizes are small. Over time, our serving sizes then and now have gotten bigger. Um, when we go eat out, if we think about three ounces of meat, when you go out to a steakhouse or something, what's the smallest serving size they'll have? Usually it's an eight ounce, right? But a lot of times you're gonna get to 12 ounce, maybe even the 16 ounce. So when we go out, especially, these serving sizes are way more. So you have to double, triple the nutrient content of each. Cooked pasta, the size of a, size of a baseball, one cup. Not, not much can fit into a cup, folks, so we usually eat more. Um, for example, uh, a 20 ounce bottle of soda is usually 2.5 servings because it's an eight, I think it's eight ounces for a serving of a soft drink. Um, if you go to get a bagel at Dunkin' Donuts, they're absolutely huge. That would be probably three to four serving sizes of what's considered a regular grain. So I'm just letting you know. Okay, this is the last thing of the chapter. Thanks for sticking around this long. I wanna just talk very briefly about nutrition certification. So if someone says I'm a nutritionist that's registered or I'm a dietitian or I'm a licensed, you know what the hell that means. Okay. I'd like you to know what registered dietitian means. This is kind of the best nutrition certification. It requires someone to have a bachelor's degree, an internship, and then pass a national certification exam. And then as they maintain their registered dietitian status, they have to keep taking um, classes as they go. So this is probably the best. If I haven't told you already, I wanna be very clear. I am not a registered dietitian. My background is more in sports medicine and sports nutrition. Um, I do not have an RD, so that's just very clear. You can read about a nutritionist. It's basically an associate's degree and some internship hours. Sports nutrition, you know, it's kind of its own thing. A lot of people say that they're a professional in sports nutrition but don't have any credentials. And, you know, sometimes that could be okay. You could come across someone that is very responsible and does their whole work. But you could also come across someone that's just relying on bro science. Um, you can read about this. You could have an RD that specializes in sports nutrition. Um, and that would be the ideal, I suppose. Um, but it can work both ways. So sometimes having personal experience, maybe you've worked with athletes or you are yourself. And if you combine that with being a really good researcher and learner, you could be a very legitimate sports nutrition professional and not hold the credential, but um, you should know this stuff. Okay. Um, and you know, lastly, um, in terms of exercise or fitness or whatever experts, there are so many different quote unquote certifications. Sometimes it's just a weekend course. 
Sometimes it can just be an online quiz and they get a certificate. There are nationally recognized ones. Um, if you have any questions about those, you can ask me. But you really want to, before taking advice from someone, you really want to know what their background is so you can get a sense of how, um, how legitimate they are. Here are some examples. You do not need to know these, but I am just giving you the information. Same thing with personal trainers. There's a really wide variety. You do not have to know any of these. These are some examples. Um, but do your research so you know, is this person someone I can trust? All right. And the last thing I want to say is this course here in sports nutrition, you know, we're... We're no joke here, Hudson Valley Community College. So my goal is to make a very legitimate course that can be transferable to four-year courses, four-year schools, excuse me. And you will learn and you will know much more than many people out there who call themselves a personal trainer or a fitness expert. So by taking this course seriously, by having these resources, you're going to know a lot, folks. That's a good thing. All right, I'm done with this one. I will see you for chapter two.